Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome back to Top Traders Roundtable, a podcast series on managed futures brought to you by CME Group, where our guest host today, Chris Solas, continues his conversation with James Kutulas, Roy Niederhofer, and Tim McCourt, where they discuss the current state of the crypto space. So without further ado, let's rejoin the conversation. When I when I see the spectrum of products available for offer on on the on the crypto on the hedge fund side now, the media says there's over 300 crypto hedge funds, perhaps trading 10 billion dollars. I, I put them on a spectrum from very short term to very long term. So at the very short term, we have the arbitrage guys, the exchange arbs guys that we're seeing now. The arb perhaps is is so well squeezed that now they're doing triangular arbs. Maybe they're doing Bitcoin dollar on one exchange versus Bitcoin Ether on another exchange versus Ether dollar on, on another exchange. And they're, they're becoming a little more complex because, you know, perhaps the, the easy money has been made over these past few years. So those are probably the shortest term. Then we're seeing trend followers. If we just go out along the spectrum, who are probably holding it for weeks to months. Somewhere in the middle, we see what have emerged as coin pickers. And I would liken this to the long short equity industry where they're truly go looking at fundamentals. They're looking at the bottoms up. They're trying to figure out if Ripple is going to outperform other currencies. They're trying to fic find the best one. There's a lot of beta in this strategy, but they're trying to perhaps beat the index, which necessarily hasn't been established yet. In the, hedge, the long short equity world, these stock pickers now have really established themselves. They would usually put a short on, on that, and they're really producing alpha. But what you're getting from these coin pickers are very long biased, beta type plays, hopefully beta higher than, than the index. And then we haven't talked about some of the seven to 10 year holding period investments. And this is where we see a lot of investments. This is the venture capital investments. This is what Yale made a big splash in investing in, um, you know, just about last, last month. And perhaps the easier way to invest in, in crypto is investing in the pick and picks and shovels type equity investments of crypto funds, because you're investing in a classic private equity type situation. You're not necessarily taking the coin risk, which is a very, very big risk, which we're going to talk about a little later. And that's also seen a lot of inflows. At the institutional level, I haven't seen, particularly on the public pension fund level, there's been very, very little movement. And we're going to talk about why that's very, very slow coming. They'll probably be the very last to embrace this asset class. But somewhere in the and the who has embraced the asset class right now are high net worth family office type investments. And somewhere in the middle, the ENF community is really, really starting. Perhaps some of the leaders in this space have started to go in, but they've been in it for a longer time through venture capital. Sometimes the VC funds might have 20 investments and one or two of them have been crypto for a few years. So when I talk to you know ENFs, some of them might be proud to say they have crypto investments, but it probably represents a very small amount of their, you know, of their actual risk at this point. But nevertheless, it is true that they are invested. Well, that's kind of the, the big space there. Chris, I actually have a comment on that. I would say that 90% of the people that I've talked to that have made investments have actually used the term picks and shovels. And I'm starting to get worried about whether the picks and shovels trade is the crowded trade, mm. not the crypto trade, but the picks and shovels. You know, it sounds so sensible, but the pro you know, are we at pets.com sock puppet time or are we at Petco? Every business that was created in 1996 was a viable business by 2006. But if you were too early or picked the wrong horse, you were in deep trouble. So I think it's a very, very challenging invest investment strategy, like venture in general. 
And I think the returns will probably be you know, commensurate and have a lot of volatility. You can't just say, well, I'm investing in picks and shovels and expect to get a great return. I think you have to be very careful picking managers and expect them to have unusually deep deal flow and access. And I don't think you can have a naive approach and just say, because I saw a few deals. You know, I always say the deals that I get a, a personal look at, they're the you know, 95% of the, of the apples have been picked off the tree before I see a deal. So I think, I, for me at least, I, I'd want to be with a very, very professional picker of venture deals in the space. Isn't it fair to say, though, Roy, if your thesis plays out over the next 10 years or 10 to 20 years and crypto becomes, you know, a real part of the capital structure of different companies, it decentralizes whole large swaths of industry, then almost every investment today is picks and shovels. Well, I, I think that's true, although we have to remember that a lot of these companies are proposing decentralized solutions for things that already have a pretty well-functioning centralized solution. If we think about what a decentralized Spotify might look like. Well, if you're a recording artist, holy cow, I can get 90, 99 or 100% of my royalties instead of 5% of my royalties. Well, that sounds great, but I kind of like Spotify. I'm, I feel reasonably safe taking an Uber, but do I want a decentralized Uber that has no central authority to take some responsibility? I think in a lot of cases, we're facing pretty good solutions for many of the, uh, many of the applications, and there may not be need, as Novogratz, I think, very sagely says, for more than five or 10 blockchains to support the whole world. So, you know, that creating new, a whole new coin to support a whole new ecosystem may not be a good investment either. So I can see a lot of bearish and negative views on many of these companies. Some of these things and probably things that are inconceivable right now are going to be, we'll, we'll just take for granted 10 years from now. But the many conventional applications are not particularly high profit or even that useful compared to the centralized version that already exists. Well, this is the perfect segue into the con section. I think we've been quite bullish on the asset class, and I want to talk to our listeners about some very real problems. Rubini has been one of the biggest outspoken critics of, of crypto. He gave a testimony to Congress, which I would encourage everyone to read. It's a 30-page piece, came out just a few weeks ago. And in it, he talks about the inconsistent trinity of crypto, that it's not scalable, number one, it's not decentralized, number two, and it's not secure, number three. And he's made some splashy headlines. He's called crypto, crypto a stinking cesspool, and he's called Bitcoin the mother of all scams. So I would love to get your opinion. Can we go through each of these three different counterpoints? Crypto is not scalable. James? I mean, that's just false. I mean, it's incredibly scalable. Well, can you talk about the fact that Bitcoin does seven transactions per minute versus Visa at 40,000 per minute? And if, Visa, if, crypto, if Bitcoin is truly going to be you know, a mechanism to to transfer wealth, it needs to be able to compete with Western Union and, and all of our current ways of transferring money. Sure, but I, I And mean, it's not scalable right now. Right. Right now and never scalable are two very different yeah. points, right? And you look at Lightning Network for- Can you, know, you explain for, that? For Bitcoin. Uh, so basically it uses a, a process called sharding, which instead of having each node on the network process every single block for every single transaction, it, it, they process sub blocks that are then uploaded to you know to the master chain, and and that's something that Roy probably knows the numbers, but it massive increase. It's twenty. In, they demonstrated twenty thousand per second, I think. So. Yeah. So okay, you're wrong there, Rubini. What's what's the next one? The next one is that well, I, I think there's one more. He he also talks about cost. You know, basically Bitcoin Cash you can send for free. Most of the, most of the networks are down to cents. I think for about a buck fifty, you can send a hundred million dollars of Bitcoin, and that just happened. <laughs> Someone just sent a hundred million dollar transaction for like a dollar. Okay, so certainly cost wise, it's and if anyone has ever tried to send a wire transfer to a bank, especially one that you don't deal with every day, it's you're talking hours if you can get them to do it at all at any significant size, and. In terms of scalability, in terms of rapidity of transactions, and in terms of the ease and efficiency of sending it, it's actually, you have to be very, very careful because it's so easy and so efficient to send Bitcoin, to send these cryptos from place to place. Yeah. And now for um, the security, I mean, listen, the, the blockchain itself is one of the most secure things ever created. The most. 
the most. I always hedge on a lawyer, right? <laughs> um, I'll go with Roy. The most sec- secure thing ever created. In infrastructure in general, I think you always see a last mile problem when you're you're deploying new technologies, just like high speed internet. You know, we had gigabit yeah. ethernet and, you know, dial up modems for a while in this country. And, you know, solutions come up like, you know, DSL. Now you've got, you know, 100 gigabytes at home from Comcast, right? You know, this is a security issue you know, with blockchain is, is that last mile into the wallets and people using insecure passwords or, you know, two factor, which everyone, you know, has been trained to think two factor is super safe, but now you've got phone number spoofing techniques, right? So, you know, there's, there's solutions to improve two factor with app based authentication, for example. You know, this is one, one of those gaps that look, it's scary, right? If you get, you know, hacked for $300 million worth of Bitcoin, that's a bad day. But the security on, on that last mile is rapidly, rapidly improving. But you say that blockchain has, has never been hacked and it's very secure. And and that part is true. But the majority of transactions are not taking place on the blockchain. They're taking place at, at exchanges and of the top 10 exchanges. Platforms. The platforms, right? Which comes into, you know, the, the irony of the decentralized decentralized argument is that to actually transact, to actually get fiat currency, you have to go onto an exchange. And these exchanges are vulnerable to hacks. And probably the top 10 have, you know, I think six or seven or eight of them have been, have been hacked, right? This is where we see the sensational headline, like Korean exchange loses $30 million overnight. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the reasons Taifan doesn't trade Asian exchanges. Yeah, I think the security practices that we've seen in, in the U.S. platforms is, is, is much, much stronger you know, Gemini and, and Bittrex are, are using Cloudflare. Uh, you're preparing against uh, denial of service attacks. You've got some account insurance at Gemini. You know, the, the security there is better and it's getting better every day, yeah. right? So, and again, it, to, to me, a platform is a last mile problem, right? Because the, the, the blockchain, you know, obviously can do peer-to-peer transactions. You don't need those platforms unless you want to trade it and have it, you know, active, you know, pricing on that. Like, you know, if Roy and I wanted to, you know, go buy a pizza together, you know, we, we could transact on our phones. We don't need to go through a platform to do that. I think we have to really recognize the difference between a, a transaction and an asset ownership on the blockchain. The blockchain itself is secured by, to say it's the most powerful network in the world doesn't even quite do it justice. The, the security, to give you a sense, that there was just an article I read last week, the third most powerful computer in the world, one, two, and three. This number three is performing a quadrillion operation, a few quadrillion operations per second. So that's peta, peta flops. The Bitcoin network is 10,000 times as large as that and growing probably 10% or 20% a month, if not more. So basically, you'd have to put together to do a, a, a 51% attack, which, by the way, doesn't mean that all the prior transactions are somehow suspect. It, if a 51% attack, which is what everyone is very afraid of, oh, someone can get control of 50% of the network, and then it's all over. No, it's not all over. It doesn't change what you already have on the prior blockchain, the 10 years of history, and who has what asset. It just changes a certain number of transactions that have occurred subsequent to the attack. And of course, everyone immediately sees it coming as well. In order to do that, you would have to literally create as large a computer network as already exists in the largest computer network in the world, plus, and not just 1%, because 51% begins to let you do it, but it's more like 90%. You've got to control 80 to 90% of the hash rate of the network. So now you're up to five to 10 times the size of the largest computer network in the world to hack the Bitcoin blockchain. To me, that is the most secure (coughs) electronic security ever created. Quantum computing always comes up. Oh, do we have to worry about that? No, because if there's any hint of that on the horizon, there will immediately be a fork of the, a hard fork of Bitcoin, which addresses that problem. There are already quantum resistant coins out there. The more general point is that all of these features that we talk about from coin to coin, from ecosystem to ecosystem, this one can do it for free. This one does 100,000 transactions. This one has a 30 second block time. All of these features, they're like the way bacteria develop antibiotic resistance. They graft on DNA from other bacteria and coins. Everything's in the public domain. They can grab features from each other. And there's going to be this beautiful evolution in an anti-fragile way, what Nassim Taleb calls anti-fragile, meaning that every 
problem that occurs, every chink in the armor, every injury to the system doesn't just get repaired, it gets stronger. And every exchange is stronger than they were last year because they know what happened last year. Every custody solution is stronger because they know about all the hacks. And that's what's happening. And it's happening so fast. It's never happened like this in any ecosystem. So I'm extremely optimistic that all of these arguments that we're, we're, we're hearing from Rubini and others are arguments of eight and 10 years ago that were fixed four years ago or two years ago. And if they're not fixed today in their hypothetical sense, they're going to get fixed in three months or three years. And I think it's one of the most interesting things about the blockchain is that it's a living, breathing digital organism, right? And, and, and Bitcoin's, for example, it, you know, adding those, the, the Lightning Network, it's adding atomic swaps where you could have an instant transaction across a chain into, in, into another currency. And Bitcoin was the first. It's supply constrained. At the end of every year since its launch, it's been the largest by market cap. And it's why we call it internally the Mac Daddy coin. And how do you feel, like, what is the, ar- the counter argument, though? We talk about Bitcoin being finite. There's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoins printed. But already we've seen forks in Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Cash. You talked about perhaps a, a hack where we, we simply fork. And that that is infinite. Then you, you're simply just re- recreating it. And it's a cent- the centralized ownership of that will then create the fork. And that almost is in- an internal inconsistency with this finite supply of Bitcoin. Well, again... Centralized ownership, we're not talking about that. You know, there's not one person that makes that decision in most of the cases. Some coins do have more centralized governance, which in my view is a, is a problem. And that will eventually evolve out as people realize, you know, we really do need a more democratic process. But there's, all, there's one winner. And that right now is Bitcoin compared to all of the forks of Bitcoin. Not a single fork in the history of crypto has achieved more than 10% of the original Form. There's, always, uh, there's always one winner that's 10x or more. Usually it's more like 100x or 1,000x the value of the new fork that has the great features. That's what we've seen so far. So I don't see forks as a potential com- competing supply. There won't, 21 million Bitcoin cash, that's fantastic. But there are 21 million Bitcoin with 10x plus in market cap. I also don't see new coin creation because there's no reason to have a new coin if your original coin can get the same features as your new coin. And as we see that, I think there'll be more centralization. I think we already see a power law distribution of the coins and we'll probably continue to see the major coins beat out the smaller coins for that reason. Finally, I think we have to think about if the appreciation is going to come, where is the investment going to take place? When institutions want in on a market, they don't pick the security or the ecosystem that has 1% of the liquidity. They go with the most liquid places if there's really going to be a big increase. So our view is that we're going to see institutions interested in the very top coins, if not just Bitcoin, because of the liquidity. In the case of Bitcoin itself, you also have a beautiful quality that it has in that all the other coins, or many of them, are denominated in Bitcoin. So I, I like to say it's like if you're in Mexico and you want to go to Dubai. Well, you're not going to trade uh, peso uh, durum. You're going to go to dollar first. And the, so the Bitcoin, Bitcoin is essentially the, the dollar, the safe haven asset, the lingua franca of the crypto world. And because of that, it has extra value. It's far more liquid. If you want to transact a million dollars, it's hard in a lot of most of the coins. It's, it's, it's trivial in Bitcoin. If you want to transact 10 million, you're going to have trouble anywhere but Bitcoin. If you want to put $10 billion to work, it's going to be over 30 days, over a year in Bitcoin only. So that's where I think the, the centralization of the market cap is going to take place. James, you mentioned Tether. Can you tell us and tell our listeners a little bit about background on that and, and why it's so controversial today? Yeah, so, so Tether is what's known as a, a quote-unquote stable coin, and it's, it's run by an Asian exchange called Bitfinex. And... Basically, the premise there is that on a, on a crypto platform, you've got to trade token for token. You can't trade dollar for token unless you're coming into to something like Tether, right? So operationally, the way it works is that an investor wanting to trade crypto will, will send a wire in dollars. That'll go into Tether. Supposedly, the dollars are held in a bank account, and then you're given a— And Tether is tethered to the U.S. dollar. 
Therefore, one tether equals one U.S. dollar. Supposedly, and that, right? Right, and that. And, that but it's, it's something that trades, right? So you know, it's it's broken the buck to use uh, right. money market. You know, speak a couple times, and it it doesn't have a true audit. There's some you know speculation out there that it it's potentially has been used to manipulate the price of Bitcoin by creating fictitious tethers, and since that process is not you know audited, it's it's you know it's really hard to tell the legitimacy. So there's been you know, a, a wave towards creating other stable coins. So Gemini and Coinbase have, uh, uh, you know, launched their own. I'm a partner in Basis, which we raise about, you know, a, a lot of money to, uh, you know, to start from, you know, so from the, the leading VCs and, uh, you know, to, to have kind of a, a, a stable value coin that doesn't fluctuate like Bitcoin has done in the past in order to, to be a store of value to trade other coins is, is a major, major issue on the, the digital platforms. Exactly. Well, I, I want to uh, switch topics a little bit. I want to talk about, we, we've talked a little bit about custody, regulation, and volatility. I think these are the three big hurdles for institutional investors. James, could you give us an update on, on regulation? The SEC has been looking into this for, for many years. They've made a few rulings, but where do we stand? Yeah, so uh, the SEC is focused primarily in, in the ICO market, right? And, um, you know, we're, Kind of in the early days of ICOs, up until, until actually fairly recently, a lot of issuers were going out and putting out something called a utility token, where they claimed it was just a network use right as opposed to actual equity in a company. And can we can we back up a little? ICO is an initial coin offering. Initial in co- coin offering, right? So it's it's it it basically plays off the concept of an initial public offering, which is a highly regulated, highly highly regulated um, you know process of, of offering equity to, to public markets, right? So the ICO is an inherently has been an inherently unregulated process where issuers basically tried to circumvent securities laws by by arguing that these tokens are not securities because they don't give value in the company. SEC Chairman Clayton has come out and said basically every ICO he's seen looks like a security, right? And and, and there's this kind of staple of common law called the Howey test, which lays out guidelines for whether an instrument is a security or not a security. You know, it's been my view from the beginning that the utility token concept is is absolutely a violation of, of securities laws, right? So an, an offering has to be one of three things. It's either not a security, okay, which, you know, the utility token, I think, fails on that, but, or it's a registered security, something like an IPO, like a share of Apple is a registered security, or it's an exempt security, right? And so exempt securities are normally offered under something called Regulation D. Those are limited to accredited investors or higher. They have restrictions on transferability. Generally, it's a 12-month lockup, right? So, you know, a lot of these, these ICOs have said, okay, well, here's a token. You could trade it immediately. Well, you know, that's a violation of security laws. Here's a token. We didn't make a, a Form D filing with the SEC. That's a violation of securities laws, right? So, you know, I, I really caution people who are looking at ICOs. You know, I, I estimate probably 90% are just outright scams. Yeah. Of the remaining 10%, probably, you know, 90% of those are going to fail. You know, I think the industry is going to have a problem with, with you know, class actions and securities litigation since so many of these offerings were not done in compliance with securities laws. And I think this has been the big problem over the past year. I think those numbers are exactly right. 80% have been outright frauds. Of the ICOs that launched last year, I think there was over $6 billion. Almost 80 90% are already out of business. And this has really contaminated the whole crypto story because you have real stores of value like Bitcoin. You have real protocols like Ethereum that are that are vying for the future of the internet, building the you know big the supercomputers of the, the future of, of the world. And then you've got hundreds of other tokens that are really just riding this wave. A lot of charlatans have been have, have raised a lot of money. And that's exactly what the SEC is going after. A lot of these unregistered securities that were really issued as if they were equity in a in a company, but not not registered. Roy, you have a lot of institutional investors and you're very, very close to this space. What are your institutional clients talking about when they talk to you about, about crypto? Are they are they interested? Have you seen inflows into your crypto fund? And if not, what are the hurdles for, for investment? Right now, there's a lot of interest in blockchain, I think, in very much the way people invest are interested in private equity and venture. But crypto hasn't gotten yet, except in a few cases, the very forward-looking institutions. There hasn't been a tremendous pool of interest yet. 
I think crypto is a little bit like the way alternatives were thought of about 20 years ago, where you have the more forward-looking institutions learning about it, starting to put their toe in the water. But taking a step back, in October, we had something very important for, for diversified portfolios. We had stocks down with rising interest rates. Now, for those of us that's been in the business for a long time, that's what I thought. That, that's how I thought the world worked. I, the 70s were certainly that way. It was true, except for the crash of 87. It was true all the way into 97 that stocks and bonds went in the same direction. The Greenspan put, the liquidity that was injected into the market. This poor guy, Alan Greenspan, two months into the job, the market crashes, and the Fed basically says, we're going to, basic, we're going to provide whatever support we can with liquidity. Well, what if that stops happening? And I think we have now a Fed chair that's very, very independent and is willing to say, you know what, we're going to do what's right for the economy, and we can send stocks and bonds down together. Now, it's not just stocks and bonds. You may not be marking your venture investments or your private equity deals, but they're down too. And your, your exit of your, your little uh, angel investment, that's not happening in today's market when the stock market's moving 4% every hour. And what we're in a world of is... Can you find an investment that gives you a stable rate of return that is uncorrelated or even stable completely with, with zero correlation because it doesn't move at all? In October, Bitcoin price change was approximately 0.0%, and everything else in the world, with very few exceptions, was down. As institutions become aware and understand what this represents, that it's different from gold, it's different from art. It's different from cash because you get a return that's above the cash rate. That excess return from investing in, right now you can lend and there's a yield curve already for Bitcoin, but it's going to be very robust. There'll be securitized lending. We call those bonds and notes eventually. And you're going to be able to get somewhere between LIBOR plus one or two or to LIBOR plus six or something like that as there's a beautiful positively sloping yield curve a few years from now. And no correlation and no ability to increase the supply the way companies can create more stock or the way governments can create more supply of bonds or, or currency. And that, to me, is a killer app for money that's never existed before. So the institutions are starting to think in these lines. When you're managing money with 100-year horizon, 200-year horizon, Harvard, Harvard's been around since, what, 1670? They're thinking 500 years out, 1,000 years. There's still going to be a Harvard 1,000 years from now. And we, on one side, you have 200 trillion of unfunded U.S. obligations. On the other side, you have 21 million Bitcoin, period. Where do you want to be to earn your LIBOR plus 2, LIBOR plus 5%? I think the institutions are going to get that eventually, and they're going to come in in a way that we have not seen yet in any way, shape, or form. And that's my argument for Bitcoin, 1 million or even more. Reserve currency market cap, which means 50 trillion, 70 trillion market cap. That is obviously, you know, what is it, uh, 1,000 thousand times, uh, 10,000 times where we are. And so I agree with that conceptually. My, my kind of concern is that once you have widespread adoption and acceptance of crypto, people are used to it, they're comfortable with it, it's, what stops Fedcoin, right? Which is the, 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 the government tokenizing the US dollar, banning Supply. other cryptos, though, if, if you know if they made transacting illegal like the, you know they did in gold previously, right? And then just automating taxation on the blockchain and force every transaction to go through a government controlled private blockchain. I mean that that's yeah, the big there, risk. I think. I think you're absolutely right. I, I think well a Fedcoin is basically subject to the same overprinting potential because you don't have a, a constrained supply of US dollars if maybe electronic. It's a beautiful way to collect taxes. Mm -hmm. You can even have negative interest rates and take people's electronic holdings of a Fed coin. So it actually enables policies that are not feasible with zero because people can just put their cash in the safe at that point. So my view is it may eventually come down to a, a power play between the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department. The Treasury says, holy cow, there's 200 billion of crypto net wealth we want a piece of that as people transact. We want that as a revenue source, maybe to make a dent in that $2 trillion that we uh, that we owe. Don't forget uh, about the state pension fund. And <laughs> sure, right. Liabilities, too. Right. There's, there's enormous liabilities coming. So my view is that the Treasury Department wins that battle, 
But it's possible that the Fed and all the central banks say, you know what, this is a threat to our authority, to our issuance authority, and we're going to try to ban it. We have to think globally. That may not be true in every country, even if it were to happen, if it were to happen in, in Europe, but not in the U.S. The U.S. economy is 25% of the world economy. That might be enough to take Bitcoin up 100x or 1,000x by itself. But, of course, all of these things that we talked about, all of, of Rubini's objections, all of the fear that we have of volatility, all of the potential for overregulation, the the corruption of a few of, or many of the ICO deals. Every one of these things is a reason that these cryptocurrencies are as low as they are. And there's a chance that every one of these things turns out to be an accurate objection. And this is not, a, I'm not saying I'm 100% sure to be right about this. But if I tell you, if I'm 10% likely to be right, to give you a 1,000x appreciation, that's a pretty good expectation trade. So what are the chances that I'm correct? Maybe it's 3%, maybe it's 30%. I think it's probably 60%, but that's just my view. I'm obviously a bull, but Rubini might say it's 1%. There's one in 100 chance Niederhofer is correct about this. But it's a 1,000x return. It's still a good trade. Yeah, probably right now there is no other type of trade with that asymmetry. When we look across equities and bonds that are still trading at all-time highs right now, even though we've had a, perhaps a 10% correction from its high on September 21st. I think we are almost running out of time here, so we're going to we're going to have some closing thoughts from from our panelists. And I do want to bring it over to Tim. Tim, where do you see the price of Bitcoin, perhaps at the end of 2019? And do you have any parting words for for our guests? You know, I think with respect to the price of Bitcoin, you know, I think it's 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 tough to forecast. I think in, you know my position and CME's position is we're fairly agnostic to the price of Bitcoin or the price of, of the future. What we're really focused on is such that when people either think it's going up or it's going down, uh, we actually like people to disagree on price. It facilitates trading. And when they need to trade or when they need to manage at risk or when they need to invest or liquidate their positions, they could do so at CME in a tried and trusted fashion and enjoy all the efficiencies and safeguards that CME provides when needing to do so. Thank you, Tim. Spoken like a true exchange. <laughs> James, any any final thoughts? Where do you see the price of Bitcoin? I mean, one million? I, yeah. You go one million and one? I, I don't think we're <laughs> going to see one million by 2019. I'm not a big price target fan, but I, I don't want to cop out either. I mean, I think that the uh, I think that the custody problems get solved early in 2019, and I, I think that that's going to be a massive bullish catalyst for the industry. So I, I would like to say that I think there's a high likelihood of new all time highs in, in Bitcoin in 2019. Hope you're right. Roy, you get the final word here. We know your price target is, is $1 million. Uh, you talked your evil. <laughs> $1 million. Yeah. I think we're sitting here with the largest exchange in the world as our host. That tells you something about what's happening to liquidity, with institutional custody, with the acceptance. This is just one more data point. And I think, again, there's just a possibility that I'm right about my bullish stance on this. But... It's a bet that I think is a positive expectation bet with huge potential return. And everyone, I believe, should have a piece of this in their portfolio because of the structural reasons I've discussed and we've talked about today and the trajectory that it appears to be on in every place in the, in the whole crypto blockchain ecosystem. So the, the barriers represent opportunities. The negative feelings represent bearish sentiment. And as they say with the stock market, the S&P climbs a wall of worry. There's never been a wall of worry higher than the crypto wall of worry. Well, thank you, Roy. And thank you, James. And thank you, Tim. And thank you to all the listeners of Top Trader Roundtable. This is Chris Solar signing off. And there you have it. Thanks so much, Chris, for great conversations about all things crypto. I hope you were able to take a lot of useful information from today's conversation onto your own investment journey. And if you did, please share these episodes with your friends and colleagues and send us a comment and let us know what topics you would like for us to bring up in the upcoming conversations with industry leaders in managed futures. From me, Niels Kastor-Larsen and our exclusive sponsor, CME Group, thanks for listening and I look forward to being back with you on the next episode of Top Traders Roundtable 
And in the meantime, go check out all the amazing free resources that you can find on cmegroup.com as well as toptradersroundtable.com. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.